Drafting in a $2,000 redraft league over the FFPC. We are in the main event and we are ready to go, Sean. We have the 112. We are ticking through that first round already. We did talk a little bit about this on our previous podcast, talking some potential strategy from those lit picks. So excited to see what we do over the first couple of rounds, but what happens moving forward. It's Justin Jefferson, Travis Kelsey, Jamar Chase, Christian McCaffrey, Tyree Kill, Austin Eckler, Cooper Cup, and Saquon Barkley off the board as things move forward. Sean, there is three selections before our pick as Stefan Diggs goes off the board. What are you thinking here at the 112 as we attempt to win the $1 million top prize? Well, I think that we both would probably be most excited if we were able to get the Amon Ross St. Brown, Garrett Wilson double dip. There are a couple of other interesting plays here in C.D. Lamb. We'd be excited about that. I mean, There are some concerns potentially about Bijan Robinson right now. Tyler Algier was one of the players I wrote up in the Zero RB Candidates Countdown because he appears to have really a pretty substantial standalone role. But if you wanted to make a pitch for Bijan, and that's what we opted to do here, I mean, I'm always in for a generational prospect, especially at the 112. Colin, he does go one pick before us. We have not Garrett Wilson, but we can take CeeDee Lamb and Amon Ra St. Brown. Mark Andrews also a legitimate consideration here what direction do you want to go first i think we'll, we'll go first i think it's a clear pick for simp brian with that first pick for us i think we're both in agreement there on the first one yeah and then we can play a little bit with the the clock here um for me it's between simp brian and andrews and we we talked or sorry between <laughs> cd lamb and andrews we did take simp brian um they're picking at the 112 by adp at the moment there is more opportunities to be getting the elite tight ends from the front end of the draft so if we park on pa- pass on mark andrews here it's unlikely that we do get them we talked about playing though the late round tight ends as a potential option i i think the way that the draft will play out here and what we talked about potential options at the three four turn five six turn i think it makes a lot of sense here to to get cd lamb that was what i was hoping you would say i was trying to follow will- Buster, sean did I leave it long enough? Well, we still had plenty of time. You got to really, you got your work cut out for you with the longer clocks here. 60 second yeah, clock is hard. It's hard to filibuster for 60 seconds. It is. Anyone who listened to the Stealing Bananas Pros versus Joe's show, however, uh, Ben and I did it very successfully all the way through that draft there. So you can still get in a little bit of trouble. Colin, I think that's an interesting pick right there because we know that the elite tight end provides such a unique advantage in terms of tournament play and certainly in these tight end premium formats if you have mark andrews and he goes off he's going to be very very difficult to compete with the flip side of that is just that cd lamb while he hasn't exactly been a priority for me this season i think it's easy to kind of lose track of just how good he was last season and what the overall ceiling would be for him as well when we think through you pull up the stealing signals tool here and look at his target per route run numbers and we have him coming in with Devonte adams drake london deandre hopkins just below that elite tier with tyree kill amon Ra, cooper cup and so with our first two selections there it's very exciting to get two of the elite target earners in today's nfl But the flip side of that, too, is that we would expect Lamb to be relatively efficient, 8.7 yards per target last year. That gives him almost 2.5 yards per route run, according to the Sports Info Solutions charting numbers. And we look at Lamb there, too, and he's got a 91% route rate. So um, I think there's a potential for him to end up actually running more routes for the Dallas Cowboys to be more pass heavy than people realize. Matt Irby, one of our new writers, wrote a fantastic piece on Mike McCarthy and how some of the concerns might be a little bit overstated. Now, we look at this here and we think about the fact that now you have Brandon Cooks in there with Liam. Perhaps that creates a little bit of an issue for the ceiling there going forward. But when I'm looking at Liam and I'm seeing a guy who had over 1,600 air yards last year, had almost 1,400 actual yards is going to be a touchdown threat is linked up with 
an above average QB. I certainly wouldn't call Dak Prescott an elite QB, but everything is there for him to take another small step forward. And it's easy to look at CeeDee Lamb and actually be, you know, it's not a letdown pick. I mean, you're talking about a guy who has an ADP of 111. People obviously really like him. And yet he's a little bit the forgotten man in terms of a player who could go off and be this year's Tyreek Hill, a player who could make the jump, who could be in that top five. I really like having these two guys for the start. Now, we were dreaming about Garrett Wilson, who actually has a lower ADP than both of the guys that we actually got. And yet, when you have St. Brown and Lamb here to start this draft, not only does it give us a lot of upside, but Colin, especially when we talk about how many great running back options there are between rounds three and six, it gives us a lot of flexibility going forward as well. It really does, and I think that's why I would prioritize it. If CD Lamb hadn't been there, I think I, I'd go with Mark Andrews, but um, having the option to add Lamb. And the other thing with Lamb, you know, he's entering his age 24 season. He did turn 24 in April, but because he's been in the, the league for a few years, I think people think that he's probably much older. He is still in that area where that, I think the floor with Lamb, and we're not looking for floor plays, but it feels so, so safe with him what we're going to get even if it's not a, a big season for him but he is a player who i feel could challenge the likes of chase or jefferson for you know that wide receiver one spot come next season based on his trajectory and part of that is as well you know you mentioned cooks but if we look at chase for example he is t higgins across from him who we we absolutely love but we're in situations then where cooks is somebody who has been consistently productive throughout his career but is now leading into that journeyman veteran stage we know what we're going to get and there is potential for that to be a cross from lamb to actually help him in this offense so i'm excited to get lamb and brown there interesting sean to see how it plays out now you mentioned some of the running back options since we met our selection it's aj brown nick chubb tony pollard Devontae adams jalen waddle mark andrews olave higgins smith patrick mahomes goes to the travis kelsey drafter as the second last pick of the second round then calvin ridley at the 212 josh jacobs henry and now darren waller so i mentioned sean when we were discussing it some of the options potentially by adp at the tight end position waller is somebody who sometimes sneaks his way to the back of the third round usually the fourth tight end taken that means that tj hawkinson hasn't been drafted to this point they're usually kind of roles reversed for where they go so it'll be interesting to see where he goes off the board here moving forward but you did mention some of the running backs that may go in this range we obviously have at the moment as we record this on friday the 25th of august conversations happening around jonathan taylor is he going to be with the colts the dolphins somebody else that is something we'll see how that plays out he's usually an early third round pick so we'll see he may slide a little bit and this one jameer gibbs is in this range josh jacobs we're not targeting joe mixon in this draft sean but he goes here ramondre stevenson's at the turn we're not targeting harris but the players we're really looking here is Gibbs, Stevenson, ETN, and then Brees Hall. Now, Brees Hall is generally a late fourth round pick, but we should have some options here at the turn. And as I mentioned, that TJ Hawkinson does go the next pick after Darren Waller and then Jonathan Taylor. So there is a lot of options, Sean. You were trying to see on our latest podcast if I would kick things off with six running backs through the opening six rounds. Now, I didn't do that. I don't think Sean ever realistically thought I was going to do that. But when we had, you know, if it was Bijan that hadn't have went, let's say I'm on Ross St. Brown goes at 11, Bijan would come into that potential conversation. But when we get to this next turn, the three, four turn, that seems like a real place to, to get yourself two kind of anchor running backs with superstar potential. Um, so we'll see it's always in these drafts Sean you're waiting to see how things play out because every draft will be slightly different even versus the ADP but we're using the tools on Rotoviz. Sean may have it pulled up slightly different I'm going off the last two days which has about 45 of this here particular format along with the fantasy pros format in it so we have had some news over that time you know myself and Sean will probably talk as we move through here about Jerry Judy uh, obviously with JSN with his injury some players potentially missing the starting portion of the season but that may sean lock them in <laughs> as still been targets for us maybe in a, a round later so we'll get to that point they wouldn't really be in conversation here i don't think at this three four turn but as we talk we are four selections away none of those running backs have gone off the board 
in Gibbs, Etienne, or Stevenson, along with Hall. But the you know Jamar Gibbs is usually the three oh four, and Joe Mixon's after going off the board at the three oh eight. So, what are you thinking here? Are you are you hoping that Gibbs makes it a few more picks here in a slide? Can you see any reason why he would be sliding? Hit picks past ADP. <laughs> No, not really. Not really. You have Josh Allen who goes a couple of slots before us there. He's sort of the last of the I big think three. I going to go at the 311. I'm, I'm going to predict it now. He goes at the 311 here. Well, over the last three days, Gibbs has been at 304, as you mentioned, for him to get all the way to 312. You know, this early in the draft to have a player who's that interesting fall eight slots would be pretty compelling. Now, you and I are going to have some chances at other. We also backs have some Brian as well, part of the conversation. In all likelihood. Yeah, so I mean, I don't know. I think you would have to take it if it gets there past ADP, but um, no, I think you could work with the the running back and the wide receiver here on the same roster. Yeah, you can work with it. I think that when you look at how you'd want that week 15 to 17 race to play out, I mean, you want your running back, if you draft one here, to have a shot to go for, you know, 70 to 100 points. And I mean, that's a big ask. Gibbs would have to catch a lot of passes to do it. If he and (laughs) St. Brown are playing both in that underneath capacity, you know, do they cannibalize each other a little bit? But Colin is right. Gibbs does go at the 311. Not surprised by that. Every pick that he slid by was more surprising than when he does get taken. So Colin, we're looking at Ramondre Stevenson, Debo Samuel, Brees Hall as the three names that we have on the board here. We not add three. an ETN to that list? No. ETN could also go. The other player we would have been looking at here would have been Keenan Allen. So the last two picks take our two of our prime targets, but we still have four left. Colin, we have 20 seconds. Who do you want for the well, first of these two I th- guys? I think ETN, or, or sorry, Stevenson, I think we're both agreed on. Okay, yeah. so we'll grab Ramondre Stevenson there. Uh, not scared of Ezekiel Elliott being in that backfield. Obviously, that's a famous last words <laughs> kind of situation. Colin, I really like Debo Samuel, but there probably are some other ways that we can play that 49ers passing game. I don't know. I, Brees Hall and Travis Etienne are massive slam dunk picks here. Etienne is more expensive it's possible that in some other drafts we do, we might be able to pull Hall in late. Which direction are you leaning there? I think by ADP, it probably makes sense to go for ETN here, but I'll, I'll let you make the final call. These are two of your guys. <laughs> you well, Colin, this is our main event together. I mean, this is for all the marbles, the $1 million. million. Don't pass it off. I think we go with ETN. Okay. So as long as I successfully click it, I was going to say we don't get Najee, but we have we have multiple guys in the queue there. The worst case would have been timing out on Debo Samuel. We take yeah, if, we, if we had to take a Najee, Sean, I would have. Uh, I think we would have finished up. That would have been the last episode of the Road of Bizarre Time podcast. I think we're... <laughs> the final episode is four draft picks. Four and then... draft picks and in the main event. We don't even finish the draft. We just end the end the show. But we get ET in there. It, it is interesting, Sean, and I know we're in this draft, and this is accumulating a lot more than. All the ma- all the kind of best ball minis we've done and all the other drafts, but we have taken a lot of Brees Hall. We have a huge amount of, of Brees Hall packed in our, our bags, and I, I know it's unlikely to happen. Brees Hall at the moment is a late fourth round pick, the four eleven. It's it's very unlikely he would ever slide back to where we are, but something you have to consider um, with the kind of six pick difference between him and Etienne there. If Gibbs had a slid, do you think we still go with those two particular players and? Stevenson and Etienne um, and how, how close is that for you for Hall and, and Etienne there I have those four guys just with almost identical grades and I think partly what you're trying to do there is figure out what you are trying to accomplish with this specific pick so I mean I have Gibbs ranked as 302, Stevenson 304, Hall at 307, ETN at 310. And so from that perspective, ETN is the lowest of the group, but I have them all above where they're going by ADP. I mean, there are some mild concerns about Tank Bigsby with the Jaguars that in my mind are probably, 
I don't know if more legitimate is the right term. I certainly think that Dalvin Cook is a much better running back than Tank Bigsby. At the same time, because they're in different parts of their career arcs, you know, even after they make the plunge and go with Cook, if Brees Hall looks absolutely fantastic, then I mean he's going to get the work that he needs to pay off at that spot. I mean, you could the rhetoric out of Jacksonville has been confusing enough that it does raise some eyebrows. They talked about ETN rushing for 1,600, 1,700 yards. You would expect him to put some receiving production on top of that. And at the same time, they seem to think that they can get Bigsby a lot of production as well. Now, we know that these NFL teams are going to have committees in 2023 in most cases, but anytime that there's as much enthusiasm for the backup as there seems to be, you want to be at least price aware as you're drafting the star. But, you know, we go back to the really fun shows that Ben and I did for Stealing Bananas where he had Travis Etienne as next year's 112. I had Etienne in the second round. When you're getting that player at the 401, I mean, you can handle a little bit of that risk. Again, ETN, one of the most electric backs in the NFL, wrote a big piece about him and how he compares to even guys like a Jamal Charles. He is set to go off this season. And I mean, he's one of my favorite ways to play this Jaguars offense where I like all four of their receiving targets, but those guys are tricky in relationship to price. And then Trevor Lawrence, I think, is actually a really nice buy. And yet at the same time, I don't know that Lawrence addresses structural concerns that you have from a big picture perspective. So as we kind of think through that and where our different incentives are and how we want to play Jacksonville, it always comes back to Travis Etienne being this elite player at such a perfect price. Yeah, I would agree with with all of that. And it, for me, it was really neck and neck between between him and Hall. And, uh, you know, on a different day, I might have leaned a different way. It's always going to be interesting, Sean. When we record these... We have in the past had teams that made finals. We've had teams that have won big money. And it's always interesting to listen back and see where some of the kind of 50-50 calls were, who you went in on and who you went out on and how that works out, both positively and negatively. The Travis Etienne versus Brees Hall one could be interesting. But the thing is, <laughs> across the board, we're going to have a lot of both of those guys. Interestingly in this draft, Sean, Lamar Jackson makes it to the um, 4-9. And something that I love that the FFPC have added into the website over the last couple of months is also the you know instead of having to calculate every single time there's a pick it does now similar to underdog add in the exact pick number as we go through which for most people it probably doesn't matter but for streaming drafts it makes it very convenient Brees hall does go one pick after lamar jackson the reason i mentioned jackson sean something that i had considered doing but i didn't really want to invest as much in one specific offense through three rounds is it is pretty possible if you take andrew's at that 201 spot to potentially get Lamar Jackson then at the 312 or the 401. We didn't talk through that as a possibility at all, but it was something that I had kind of been been playing around with. But I feel like the way that we started is the the way that I wanted to go. You had mentioned though, Sean, about loading up on running backs, and we've done a lot of shows over the last couple of weeks about the actual value of running backs this year in these kind of rounds three, four, five, six. A lot of the time, the best pick is actually that running back option. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what we do through these next couple of picks. My preferred option as we move through this draft would be to you know, maybe get one more running back, potentially two more running backs through those opening 10 rounds if any of the players that we're targeting do fall to us. But then I like to get into those zero RB guys and beyond that and try and fill out the, the roster that way rather than as you... I'll say tongue-in-cheek, said Sean, uh, get those six running backs to start off the draft. But since we did pick Debo went off the board, DJ Moore, Najee Harris, Amari Cooper, Kenneth Walker, Kettle, Pitts, Jackson, Hall, Deontay Johnson, Mike Williams, Justin Herbert. So we'll see as we sit at the 501 what happens over the next 10 picks before our selection. But Sean, looking at some of the options that you might like, I do see we have clicked Jerry Judy into the queue. Obviously, the pulled up in, in training at the end of this week and looks like he is going to miss some time to start the season how are you feeling how are you playing that moving forward with guys like him and jsn are we for me i'm still looking to target them and particularly now when we've started off with two elite wide receivers giving you that little bit of time maybe to get those guys 
back on the roster as the season progresses. How are you feeling about those guys? I'm sure if it's a tiebreaker with a similar ranked player available and them, we'll go for the healthy guy at this moment in time. But how are you feeling about Jerry Judy at the moment? And I suppose we can, a, a later potential target in JSN, how are you feeling about those guys with the injuries? Yeah, I mean, Judy is one of these guys who has just been so frustrating to play. And I keep kind of going back to the well because I do think that if he were to stay healthy, you'd be talking about him as like the wide receiver 14. So I think you could put him in for Calvin Ridley there, and that would be the appropriate price. The problem is just that has never been what's actually happened. And, you know, so the situation yesterday was just another reminder that it's always a roller coaster with Judy. And one of the frustrating things that happened last year is that he was injured at the very beginning of games on multiple occasions. And so not only do you have the injury in general, but you have the injury for a guy who was actually in the lineup for you. How many T Higgins had kind of very weird seasons where, you know, between being active early injuries, it was just the two of them had strange campaigns. They did. They did. And you don't want to overstate that. You don't want to think that that's going to <laughs> be overly predictive of what happens in the future, which is one of the reasons why we've targeted him. One of the reasons why my ranking on him has been fairly aggressive. And yet it just, it ends up being so frustrating. So I think the five, six turn is actually a pretty decent price for him. If the reports that it's a moderate strain and that he might just miss a couple weeks. I mean, if you get, jerry judy at the five six and he misses weeks one and two and comes back healthy then i mean i think you're starting to look pretty good but we do have some other options where we don't have to deal with that i mean chris godwin goes right in this range brandon Ayuk goes in this range in the last several days as you mentioned jsn has almost come back to the seven eight turn now i mean the problem there is that you're going to be sitting there thinking you know throughout the entire seventh round like make it make it make it make it and he, i mean he's going to go a couple picks short it just I don't think it's realistic to get back to 712. So we're probably not going to get him. We kind of put that out there into the universe, and maybe the universe gives us I one think back. we'll get him, Sean. I think he'll come back. Okay, okay. I was able to call the Jamar Gibbs pick perfectly, so I think. Well, JSN perfectly, but, but a slot short, yes. No, I I agree with you. I'm, I'm enthusiastic about that. We're going to get wide receiver options at the 7-8. Maybe not fantastic ones, but there are going to be – some guys there. So when we're four picks away now, some of the names that we'd be looking at, a Drake London, Dallas Goddard was really someone that I was hoping would fall to the five, six, because that would address a big need. He goes, you know, basically as his ADP, a couple spots ahead. So now Javante Williams, James Cook, Chris Godwin, Brandon Ayuk, JK Dobbins. Are you tempted at all to grab two out of three of Javante Williams, James Cook, and J.K. Dobbins? Or is that... that's? I love the concern in Sean's voice as he... I love the concern in Sean's voice as he asked that question. I, I'm actually very open to that. And this was kind of when we were talking about the pre-strategy. You mentioned the six. I mentioned four through ten. That would be my four. And that list that we've gone through, you know, we've got Stevenson and Etienne. We talked about uh, Gibbs and Hall realistically that other list is what we're kind of hoping to get there um, as Terry McLaurin goes off the board. So those guys and Ayuk are, are very much in play for me, but I'm, I'm on board with that. What, what way you, if we have a preference here as we wait for two more selections, I feel like um, Javante and James Cook are the probably preferred options that I would go with. I know you really like Dobbins. What, what's your thoughts here? Yeah, well, Drake London is this oh, yeah. he goes, like we're talking of he's talking to, he's turning into jameer gibbs here he's going to go he to the 311 he is so his adp 502 judy goes, go. oh judy goes so we have the 502 on london he has been somebody that i have been <laughs> mildly fading at his adp he does go 511 so we are he, getting we're getting jsn showing at this next turn after this it's gonna be perfect okay okay I like it. That's what I. So we are on the clock. Forty nine seconds left to talk through the first selection, then get into the second one. Who's is Javante the the first one up here for you? Yeah, I mean, you've got that Sean Payton offense. You got the elite peripherals. I mean, Javante Williams was an incredible football player before the injury. It seems like he is back. Let's go ahead and take the plunge there, and then we can discuss what we want to do. 
in the sixth I think round this here. A, yeah, this is a bit of a closer decision for me. If we're playing it by, you know, if we're just going by ADP, you can tell me your rankings after this with James Cook, usually the 5-12, and then we get Godwin just in the, the mid-sixth. Brandon Ayuk is usually the first pick of this next round. J.K. Dobbins then in similar range to that two picks in. So let us know your rankings, Sean, with 37 seconds left to go, and then we'll we'll make that final call. Yeah, so I have Cook at 5'10". I do have Brandon Ayuk in the middle of round four. And so... Well, the next thing I was going to say to you is I, if we don't go wide receiver here and then we do go in the next round and we don't get JSN, who I'm hyping up here, it can, you know, there is still running back options as we move through, through the draft. So I'm, I'm not against going that way. Okay, so why don't we go ahead and take Ayuk there? I think that's a great value and... It allows us to do what we discussed at the 3-4, which is that you have Debo there. You feel like he's probably you know, the best player in the vacuum, and yet you're able to go ahead and get Ayuk at the 5-6. If we have those guys fairly close together, and I think it only makes sense to have them close together, you can look at their splits uh, in the second half of the 2021 season, after Brandon Ayuk really came on, the first half, obviously, he was sort of in the doghouse. You look at the splits then last year when Brock Purdy took over. In both of those cases, Ayuk's numbers just massively jump out at you. And he looks like a guy who should be going at probably uh, you know mid three. I think it's a really hard choice to take guys like DK Metcalf, Calvin Ridley over a Brandon Ayuk. And so when you get him at this spot and he does some things for you positionally helps you balance that. And like you said, I mean, I think that we're going to get some names at the seven, eight turn, but I've also gotten a lot more interested again in Deandre Swift, somebody who by ADP probably doesn't quite come back to us. And yet he would be another running back option there. If we push it a little bit. So instead of getting, you know, just way <laughs> kind of, you know, out over our skis on the running backs, we go ahead, balance what we're doing here through the first six rounds. And that we've talked all off season about how you have to manage both the wide receiver avalanche and you have to create some exposure to those running back picks, especially when we're out on the edge, when we have a turn pick as opposed to being in the middle and being able to grab some of those values. Now, it's interesting because the drafter here in 11 whom we've mentioned a couple times has gotten some great values. Oh yeah. The non -value really really picks good draft so far for them are, are pretty interesting too. So that yeah. team is named magazine drafter, which I do find hilarious. You've got Bijan Robinson, Jameer Gibbs, James cook at running back. You've got AJ Brown, Debo Samuel, Drake London at wide receiver without having looked that closely at some of the teams that are a little bit further away that from us, I am feeling like that is the team that is our, closest competition in the early going and i say that you know a little bit tongue-in-cheek and that obviously everybody is a, a competitor here and one of the interesting things column i think when you look at this board right now is that every team has a qb except for the 10 11 12 so yeah. we've got the first nine drafters making some bets on these elite qbs those teams also are much more heavily loaded up on tight ends and then we have these three teams at the back who are running back wide receiver. That will be an interesting mix slash battle to follow as we work our way through. But it also does underline how your draft slot makes a difference. So one of the things we talked about is that if you have this slot at the end, it is harder to get those tight ends. Yeah, definitely. It's harder to get them. And it's interesting, you know, you mentioned the team in the 11. And what I felt pretty much throughout this draft is players we've talked about are players we were thinking about potentially getting. And I know they were values for them in London and Gibbs particularly, but they are drafting the kind of same profile and same targets of players that we would be considering at that particular time of drafts and and that can sometimes be tricky because now when we're waiting for players to come back we're going to have to watch them every single time don't be surprised if they snap up a, a fallen jsn here as it comes back around but the other thing to note is on the other side of the board some of those teams are potentially making decisions based off what players are doing to the left of them for example in this particular draft if you're drafting at the six you're thinking about what happens before it goes to the one and then back to you we see those teams with tight ends quarterbacks and some of those 
players being pushed up a little bit in terms of ADB. Not much, but a, but a little bit as we, we look through it. So we won't be picking Sean now for another about 13, 14 picks. But so far as the draft has kicked off, I'm, I'm very pleased because there can be, you know, the fear of the, the 12th slot is when you get to, say, the, the sixth round, you're like, I, I really dislike this team. <laughs> this team is not going the way I, I would have hoped. But if we, you know, talk through this, the scenarios we talked through on last Friday's podcast, this is pretty much what, what I was thinking we would hopefully do through those opening uh, five, six rounds. So I think we're off to a really nice start. Gives us lots of options here as we move forward, but will give us some challenges at both tight end and quarterback. Uh, feels like now we're into you know potential players like Tua, for example. It'll be interesting when we get to that range if we talk about Dak Prescott. Not somebody I'm actively targeting this year, but now that we also have CD Lamb, you know, we did talk off air last week if we got wilson would we take rogers does that same thing kind of apply to prescott who does go a couple of rounds earlier usually than rogers but we may be into that lit later conversation and, and jared goff would obviously come into play as adp at the moment 14th round so lots of things to talk through at both tight end and quarterback as we move forward here but sean one of the things that i wanted to mention was you know with tears with how things can play out you mentioned getting the two elite options at the two, the one, two turn. We obviously get Simp Brown, who is, you know, at that point, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seventh wide receiver off the board. We then we get Lamb. So we get two of the top eight guys that go off the board. That second round is two running backs off the board, one tight end, one quarterback. The rest of those players, all wide receivers. So it kind of starts a little bit of a run there, which also means that we don't see a huge amount of the running back targets that we'll be considering at the next turn going off the board. And then in that, third round we get two quarterbacks two tight ends only the two wide receivers but it's the last two at the very end of that kind of option of Allen and dk metcalf but that also is what pushes gibbs almost to us gets a stevenson and etn i think that those opening four rounds played out probably as well as they could barring us getting gibbs um at that point and i don't think there's much splitting that so we have seen david montgomery alvin kamara george pickens go off the board some of the targets that we would have hoped that maybe would have potentially lasted but we hadn't much faith in lasting back to his chris godwin Jahan dodson go off at the back of the sixth round pickens would have been in play as well how are you feeling as we we sit here is there a holding of the breath to see what happens with the likes of deandre swift and uh, obviously jsn is the other pick because he is he's getting back to us here well i i think that you have hit it in the lead do expect the very last pick that he could go in would be that drafter at the 7-Eleven. So when we look beyond that, we're looking at guys like Jordan Addison, Zay Flowers, Sky Moore, Elijah Moore, Quentin Johnston. The rookies there are interesting because we won't have to play them in the first couple of weeks unless we have more injuries between now and the start of the season. When you go through six, and you have this 3-3 start that we have, that would be your two running backs, your two wide receivers, and your two flex spots. Right now, very positive buzz for Flowers, a little bit less positive buzz for Quentin Johnson, even notes that Palmer could end up being the third guy there at least early in the season. Addison, I think a, a very high ceiling, but not much of a floor with the two superstars he goes at 705 so he's not going to make it back to us and then the other conversation marquise brown interesting because it does kind of set you up to start thinking already from the very beginning of a very late kyler murray selection at qb and you had mentioned dak prescott i think for me jerry goff would be the guy prescott has an 11th round adp goff has a 14th round adp that's a pretty meaningful difference and i think that goff is actually the better pick even just in a vacuum so we'll be looking at Goff and then offsetting Goff or complementing him with you know maybe this player who isn't healthy for a while but you get through I mean Jerry Goff seems like he's going to score just fine to get where you where you need to be if the rest of your build is good right so we're gonna have to hit on some of our other guys but I think that he will get you across and then when you're trying to win the whole thing Maybe Kyler Murray is the play. If you're thinking about it that way, then Marquise Brown becomes at least vaguely interesting. He's a guy where if he hadn't spent so much of training camp injured and injured in a way that doesn't seem like a big deal, then he would be more expensive. 
he would also be more expensive if there were any confidence at all about the kind of quarterback play that we're going to get in the first half of the season. But in the same way that Kyler Murray could be a second half of the year, you know, tournament type winner, Marquise Brown is someone where if Kyler Murray comes back and Marquise Brown is healthy, then, I mean, he's somebody who, again, I mean, you're looking at as being, you know, a better pick than, you know, Amari Cooper, DJ Moore, Mike Williams, those types of guys. And so I think that's the consideration that we have to work through as we get here to 712, 801 injuries with JSN, weirdness with Marquise Brown, and then the rookie element with Zay Flowers. Those are probably the three main picks that we're looking at. It would be great if we actually had those options and we had to decide on two out of three when we were actually on the clock. Yeah, Swift went off the board. I was whole, He was the one when we took Ayuk at the last pick. I was really hoping we'd get back to us there. Obviously, there'll be more options as we move through here, but Swift would have would have really stood out there. And come on, the drafter at the 311 this time cannot just take JSN on this. Uh, unless he, this is why we don't do these live. People sometimes ask, why are we not doing some of these drafts live? We don't want people taking our picks. I know Pete and Pat are happy to do that, uh, but we, we don't want that happening here. But Sean, we are one pick away. 311 is he taking jsn i would say he is otherwise i'm just on a kind of a, a i don't know i'm turning into a profit on this draft if, if he makes it one more pick but we are looking at probably him and marquise brown here zay flowers is the other i have after that i have kind of a big break to those other guys how are you feeling if we if we go with jsn and brown here if we get one more pick as the clock is ticking down here for the three eleven or the the 11 drafter yeah, and one of the things that this drafter has got to be working through is in the same way that we wouldn't have to start JSN or Marquise Brown in week one, they don't either because they also have those positions covered. So, I mean, this is a spot where they can take that risk. I I mean, I expect it to be one of those two players. Dalvin Cook. Take Dalvin Cook. I hope he takes Dalvin Cook. <laughs> I took Marquise Brown. But my thing worked out, Sean. We got... <laughs> I don't know if we pass in JSN here. Um after all this so he takes marquise brown that will make the i think the second pick will become into conversation i think we're both agreed here we'll let the we have 47 seconds left on this pick we'll we'll let it click down a bit but any concerns with jsn you know obviously now that we have brown lamb and Ayuk, it does give you that bit of freedom as well with if he misses you know two to three weeks to start the season yeah i know i think there's zero percent there and so we get pushed back to this kind of bigger question of what do we want to do on the next pick and so go ahead and click js then there we're looking at the redraft adp for this tournament zay flowers the 802 you've got some other you know possibilities i guess i don't know where else we would go i like brian robinson i think he's a good fit for this format I don't, I don't really think he's enough. I, I do. I, I do like him, but I don't think he's enough to you know, do that round reach on him. Over Zay the wide receivers. Well, with Brian Robinson, I was saying about the round reach. I would be right, right. Yeah. But are we are we going on here on Zay? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Okay. So, Colin, we did get to choose between the two out of three. Now, the decision to have taken those three running backs early i think is is very fun because our five wide receiver group of amon ross cd lamb brandon Ayuk, jackson smith and jig zay flowers a really good mix there a ton of upside the ability to still dominate the flex and that's been one of the interesting things i think about 2023 i've talked so much about how zero rb is probably not the way to play it this year because rounds three and four are so weak at receiver and so strong at running back but the flip side of that is you're actually getting some guys in rounds six and seven especially certainly in round five and then if you have an early pick in round eight and we talked on the previous show about what some of the potential disadvantages of being at the turn are and that round seven eight would be potentially a big handicap and instead I feel like it's been this wonderful gift where the injury to JSN has pushed him to the 712. We get to add in there. I mean, we would have definitely taken him at the five six turn if he hadn't had that injury. I mean, oh, no yeah. question. We would have, I would have. We would have taken him over Ayuk. That would be yeah, no question. Yeah. And so, 
you get him coming all the way through back to the following turn. And then Zay Flowers, um, more questions there because you have to like Mark Andrews. And then, the, I mean, Rashad Bateman is still there. The passing offense probably not going to be high volume enough to make all of these guys winners. And, you know, I've said throughout this entire process, the Zay Flowers actually does have some warts on his prospect profile that you don't want to completely ignore. And yet you also don't want to ignore what the player is just actually doing. And he's been fantastic in camp. He's looked great in the preseason games. The Ravens are raving about him. I Right now I have a really hard time with Jordan Addison going ahead of him. And it's not like he's going ahead of him by like multiple rounds or anything weird like that, but I would prefer flowers straight up. And so to have that mix at this point in the draft, I, we've always said this. The structure is really important, but so is player selection and player selection from a profile perspective and then also from a humility based perspective. But when you put those things together and then you look at the board here, but if you were just a, if you didn't know ADP and you said, okay, we're going to start with five wide receivers and those receivers are Amon Ross, CD Lamb, Brandon I, Jackson Smith, and Jigba and Jay Flower, Zay Flowers, you'd be like, well, I mean, maybe you're thinking you could have gotten a little bit more, but you're fine with that. And then, you know, if the curtain is pulled back, the blindfold is taken off, and you're like, oh, but you also have Ramondre Stevenson, Travis Etienne, and Javante Williams on your team, you'd be like, what are you talking about? Right? That That's not possible. And so, again, that's not to say that we're going to win this league or anything to that effect. You look at, again, the other side of this board, and there's a lot of purple. There's a lot of red. Those teams have the elite QBs and tight ends that are going to make a difference, right? Yeah. We're going to have to figure out ways to make those points up. But I, but I love this, right? I love it. And it's one of the reasons why we've had so much fun this season, because I don't want to say that drafting had become automatic in the past. That's never true. And if you feel like that's what you're doing, then you really want to kind of refresh and make sure you're questioning everything that you do. And yet it's been such, it's been such a wonderful experience to be able to go through and do some different things in drafts. And Colin, this is probably the most fun I've had in a decade. Yeah, so well, it feels this season feels like I, I wouldn't, I can't say a reset when you were saying it, I was trying to think of the word, but it's like it almost feels like a slightly new game. So we're, we're playing these formats that we played last year, but it feels like there's a almost a different element to it that you know you're trying to change your strategies and, and work through it. And there's a lot more questions than maybe there had been in the past. I can't think of the right phrasing as to to what the terminology should be, but it, it does feel that way. And one of the things I was going to say earlier is the likes of Stevenson, Etienne, and Obviously, Williams had his injury, and people maybe think that he should have hit higher heights than he has hit so far in his, in his career, potentially. But it's the same with Etienne. Etienne is somebody who had a, missed his first season, had production last year, and now is still going in that range. If, if this was two years ago, Etienne would have been going in the second round, I think, from what we would have seen previously. And I think we would have seen Stevenson probably go in, in similar ranges. And this year, because the landscape has changed, they are now third fourth fifth round pick so if, if they're going in the second round we're we're you know advocating to pass on those guys but when they're going where they're going and allowing you to set up rosters in the way that you can possibly do here it, it is obviously a lot of fun when we look at it then sean you know this was part of the reason i, I didn't want to go in and go as heavy at running back and let's say we started off with Bijan. i don't know who we'd have taken in the second there's not really a strong option in the second but what I would be thinking then is see when we get to the well, pick as soon as or, Jonathan Taylor is on the Dolphins, yeah, you're going to be looking round. at a first round pick. Like, yeah, you could go yeah. Bijan, Jonathan Taylor there and be really happy with it. it. It can change very quickly. That's true. So, the one thing that I was going to mention there is if you are starting off and it's, you know, a last group of wide receivers at the top, and then you're feeling a lot of pressure taking the JSN pick, knowing he's going to miss the start of the season, how is that going to affect the rest of your draft strategy? You know, you're at Brant and Ayuk and where we were quite relaxed as to what might happen and who might get through, I think there's a lot more panic and you're hoping on that player to make it through. This has feel, felt very relaxed so far outside of waiting on JSN and when Swift went. They were my two pressure points so far in this draft, but enjoying it so far. Sean, one of the players I was really hoping might get into the conversation and getting back to us was Jalen Warren. He has 
Locked excellent. Usually a late ninth round pick by ADP over the last couple of days goes at the 901. Very fair pick. If Flowers wasn't there at that last selection, he may have come in to consideration. So he is gone. Speaking of injured players, though, as the, the draft has progressed here, Traylon Burks is currently um, obviously having some issues, but may come into play at this next turn as he goes off the board, as I, I mentioned that. Um, so where are we starting to, to lean down to? I mentioned Tua earlier. I think without having Waddle or Hill, I'm probably happy to uh, you know continue to, to push it down towards that golf territory. Yeah, I... I mean, we have enough of him overall, and I think I mean, one of the things that's kind of fun is that he would be opposite one of our receivers here in Week 17. Now, for this tournament, looking to win the $1 million, you're trying to feel what is that path across three weeks. Yeah. And so you, know, you have the, the Dolphins-Ravens matchup, but there's certainly no pressure to get him, especially now that we have – so many drafters who spent early at QB and are now behind and have to get back at the other positions. And I, sh- and I should say behind at those positions. I mean, you can make the argument that we're behind at <laughs> the other two, right? But there are different pressures. And I do expect these three drafters or the other two drafters with us at 10 and 11 to also really push quarterback. That'll be something to track and see if it ends up being the case or not. I think that extremely inexpensive quarterbacks are going to be the way to play this and so as we move through round nine we have lost a few interesting names i i thought there was a chance that quentin johnston would fall all the way through he goes at the 810 Kadarius tony in redraft i think is actually more interesting than in best ball because i mean you're not looking at like massive holes for huge chunks you're looking at the start set decision where you know maybe you get some interesting or meaningful intel that allows you to do that somewhat appropriately. He goes at 9-2. Burks goes at 9-4. Bateman goes at 9-5. The guys that I have here on our board are Brian Robinson, Romeo Dobbs, Rashad Penny, Sam Two Laporta. players I would love to go here. There's three selections, Sean. Sorry to interrupt, but we have obviously taken their co-partners, but P. Ryan and Bigsby going before us here would be nice. It would free up a lot of options now that we have obviously the other side of those. Um, a lot of names that you mentioned there that, that fall in here and being very interesting. And, and I know I talked about Swift and not getting him, but Penny definitely comes into consideration here at this turn if he makes it to us. So the nice thing about how this is kicked off, lots of flexibility and options for us. Interesting picks there, though, Sean, uh, I wanted to mention at the tight end position and Cole Komet, usually a 12th round pick. He has gone here. The ninth round, Brian Robinson was somebody you had mentioned. He almost made it all the way back to us here, which would have been interesting. And then and Joku also went off the board. Um, somebody who tends to go in the, the ninth round range, so he's a, a fair pick there as well. Dobbs goes off the board, Sean. He was somebody I was I was hoping would make it to us. It feels like we're in a competition here with the 11 drafter again for, for Penny. Who's your second option? Obviously, we have Brian Robinson's gone, as you mentioned. Some of the players who would be in that next range. Is, is the likes of uh, A-Chain kind of completely out for you here with the rumors with uh, the Dolphins? How, how do you want to play it here? It's probably probably Sky Moore and Penny if it if it works out here. This Kincaid goes off the board, and he did. He lasted quite a bit there. He's usually the nine oh one. I've been looking here to see if we had some other picks that would make sense, but it took in part so that. Like my entire season doesn't rely on Sam Laporta, but Colin, there's just there's nobody else. We did hit a flat zone in nine ten. We had talked about that as being very likely. I think we go Laporta on this first pick, address that tight end position, and then see where we want to go in round ten. Do it. I was going to make a joke to say not to do it, but then I thought we had only fifteen seconds left, and that might have been the wrong thing to do. Uh, it is interesting because, as you mentioned, Kincaid goes right before us. He's another player where it's a full round discount that Magazine Drafter gets with the 11 spot. The player I have here for us is a full round reach. Colin, what are your thoughts on taking a big reach on 
Jamison Williams going ahead and adding Rasheed Rice. Now, all of these names, the other one, Marvin Mims, those three guys all in theory should come back to us. Rashad Penny would be somebody to help continue building out our extreme running back upside. I think I would go for Penny. Who are your other pitches for? Jamison Williams, Rasheed Rice, and I think Marvin I would Mims. risk seeing if they if they make it back. Okay, so we'll take Penny, and we do expect at least one, I would say, of those three receivers to make it back. I think all three could. This was something I wanted to hit you with because I think it came up on the ship chasing main event draft on the Jamison Williams side of things, but the vibes around Jamison Williams have not been good. Uh, him and Kadarius Tony are like in a battle to see who can, you know, have the worst PR, uh, you know, in training camp where people want to just have positive news coming out. And obviously, we're missing Williams as well for the start of the season. What is your thoughts? Any concerns? You know, is there a possibility that we're still going after him based on the profile that may just be going to flame out in the NFL? Yeah, I mean, I'm not scared of any of that. We've got <laughs> we've got five Sean's wide receivers. No ghosts. <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is a guy who is a top fifteen NFL draft pick. Who it doesn't matter if he's healthy right now because he can't play for six weeks because you know he decided to use his phone to gamble at the team facility or whatever it was. I mean, he doesn't seem like a great decision maker as a twenty one year old, which. I mean, I think it's easy to to be like, oh, well, the people are young. It doesn't matter. I mean, it's a concern, right? You're a professional athlete. You're, you need to make better decisions. And yet, did all of those plays that happened at Alabama just disappear? I mean, this guy was running by SEC corners like they were standing still. And we've watched him do it at the NFL level. That was, that was a couple of times last year, Jerry Goff missed him. You know, in preseason, he's dropped one of those passes. But we saw him do it for a full season where he was the best wide receiver in all of college football. I mean, we're going to say that's just Bryce Young because I mean, we've watched Bryce Young play in the preseason. It looks awful. <laughs> it looks awful. Like if you gave Bryce Young the choice of the guys he's got or Jamison Williams, I mean, do you think he would hesitate for a split second? Do you think he oh, cares? He wants about, Adam I mean, Thielen. He wants Adam Thielen. Come on, Sean. So, so that, that was the one thing I was going to say is like, you know, when somebody comes back from a, a knee injury like that, you're thinking, will he have that, you know, explosiveness? Will he have the same speed? And, you know, when he was playing last year, we've seen it on a, only a couple of plays, only a handful of plays, but the, the speed is not gone. He does go off the board, though, Sean, as I mentioned that. So the, the 10 07. I, I would agree that the upside is, is still immense, but the concerns are definitely there. With that pick, we did take Laporta. So, we we I mean, have Jameson Brown. goes to JC and KC. So the folks in KC know what's going on, Colin. Yeah, they know they know what's going on. But was there? I guess you know if we if we look to get golf last year or in the, sorry later in the draft, do we want to? I, I guess the answer is going to be yes. Sean's going to say that the Detroit Lions are are ready to take that next step forward again because we were all in on them last year when people thought that they were going to be a bad offense but would that be too heavily in invested here in the the lions well i mean once everybody agrees with you it's no longer exciting to do so i mean are we still in on the lions now that we know that they're good we get an interesting no, that, that value there year. in round 10 with deshaun watson going to draft sharks so that'll be an interesting one again matt would be a good article on watson and kind of thinking through his range of outcomes. Make sure you check that out on the site and call them that coupon code RV radio 2023 is good for you this week. It'll get you 10% off that one year subscription. As you look at the great work from Blair Andrews, I do think that Curtis Patrick is going to have a piece. We've had some cool nuggets from Dave Cabin. Obviously Matt has been on fire in his debut for Rotoviz. Michael Dubner doing some cool stuff. I think we're going to have part three of Conor O'Driscoll's series on how to win the ffpc best ball tournament so all of you best ball and specifically ffpc enthusiasts which i'm guessing a lot of you are as you're listening to this main event draft you're going to want to check that out colin we've been having so much fun on the site this week use that coupon code save yourself some money 10 rounds are now in the books yeah so we have st brown lamb stevenson etn 
Williams, that's Javante Williams, Ayuk, JSN, Zay Flowers, Sam Laporta, Rashad Penny. Setting up pretty, pretty nice, pretty tasty for us, Sean, so far. Since our last pick, Dalton Schultz, Tanks Bigsby. I have a problem, Sean. I always say Tanks Bigsby. I can't say it without the S at the end of Tanks. I like it that way, though. I just can't figure out how to do it. It's just, I have had players over the years where I just could not pronounce correctly, and that is one of them. Uh, Nico Collins, then we get Juju Smith Schuster, Dulcich, 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 Jamison Williams, Sean Watson, P. Ryan, Jamal Williams, Tyler Higby, Gerald Everett, Joanne Johnson, then we get Darnell Mooney, Devin Achain, and then we get Odell Beckham. So rounding back, there is seven picks to go before our next pick. Then we'll have obviously the double tap at the turn. We are going to be drafting at the 11 12. I'm very excited, Sean, with how this draft has kicked off. Firstly, how are you feeling? And then what are you thinking here at these next picks? We did talk previously about the options we hoped that may slide true to us. One of those was Jameson Williams. He went. Still hope for the the other one sliding true here. Yeah, I'm I'm literally on the edge of my seat. I'm fired up for this draft. It is I mean, when you have the 112, this is the perfect start. Now we didn't get Garrett Wilson, but we're not going to worry too much about that when you have Amon Ross St. Brown and CD Lamb. The rest of those first eight rounds went perfectly i really want these two wide receivers and then once we have that i think that we can start to look at quarterback options there are some names here at 11 12 they're at least vaguely interesting we're going to need to load up on tight ends late colin we don't have a quarterback yet but according to ffpc adp our you know kind of our, our first target of the two jared goff barely goes ahead of the kickers and defenses so that's the advantage of waiting. It's the advantage of having Amon Ra as your wide receiver one because you're already kind of set up to make that the overall play. And you mentioned kickers and defenses. We talked about this previously, but with the main event, if you have a player who would play on Thursday night football, which is the Chiefs and the Lions this year, there is an option to, to potentially move them out off that starting lineup if they didn't put up the scores you were having. So we're probably looking at some Lions and Chiefs in those uh last two rounds sean for for those positions which obviously will free us up we'll see how it plays out maybe we had a flat zone and we have to to do something slightly different but so far sean with how it's played out here through these you know last round and a half outside of uh the jameson williams pick who you talked through on the the earlier portion we are set up pretty pretty nicely here yeah and this drafter in the 11th slot has been utterly dominating the draft so from that perspective we're going to look to make up some ground over the last 10 picks but in the short term we're hoping that their build which already has five wide receivers doesn't encourage them to go receiver again here maybe they're feeling not some pressure at qb but maybe they feel like there are some upside options anthony richardson is here Dak prescott is here daniel jones is here Go for a QB and let the, yeah. the fun names fall to us. There is the QBs are falling a little bit in this draft. You mentioned Deshaun Watson in the last round. He went around after ADP two is after going, um, you know, about ten picks after ADP, eleven picks after ADP, and then we're going to see a situation here where maybe Anthony Richardson goes around and a half after ADP. He's going to go at least that if he doesn't get selected in these next two picks. So I think uh, we're, we're set up. I think it's it's going favorably. We don't want to get get over excited here but yeah i'm very happy and it, sometimes these are the parts when you get very happy in the draft sean where it, you're you're waiting to see who they pick in case it uh takes that happiness away yeah i mean we need this pick yeah okay anthony richardson so that means we'll get at least one of these two receivers we've been talking about i'd like to get them both daniel jones does go call him we got them both anything else that we need to look at here i mean dak prescott is available to go with cd lamb yeah no i don't think i don't think we will he you know dak prescott as well is around after adp here at this point but i i think that we'll we'll let it roll a little bit that would mean now at this point i believe every other team so far has a quarterback one team has two quarterbacks the team out of nine has now got allen and tua so we get rice there i, I think yeah i think mems has to be the pick unless we want to like if we look at the rest of our queue moving forward we do have rondell moore in there at the moment but it is heavily set up with running backs we have algier we have 
Johnson, we have Spears, we have White, we have Miller, we have Chuba Hubbard. And for anyone who's listening and who maybe hasn't got a chance to check Sean's Zero RB list again, if you rewind back, you may hear some of the names that are <laughs> involved in that list. But it feels like this point of the draft, Sean, you do start to move into those tight end options, you start to move into potentially looking at the quarterback, and then you're filling it out with your kicker and defense. So that, that feels like the point of the draft we are at here. We have the 13th round, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. So we have obviously 20 as well. We have eight more selections to go, two of those being kicker and defense. Feels like we're going to need at least one quarterback. We're going to need at least one more tight end. We're probably, Sean, unless something spectacular pops up here, we're probably pretty set at, at wide receiver here with our room now having seven wide receivers at this point of the draft. Taji Spears was off the board. He would have potentially been a, an option there at the, the running back position. But it feels like we're going to see what happens over the next couple of rounds, pick up a couple of those running backs that I mentioned out, pick up some tight ends, and round it out i think getting those two guys there there's for, for me and i'm sure it's the same with yourself there's quite a quite a break at that point to the the remaining wide receivers it gets it gets very very uh sporadic at this point you know going by adp you're looking at zay jones tyler boyd rondell moore mingo thielen Jaden reed kj osborne dj chark hodgson van jefferson hyatt tank dell michael gallup mvs uh, Donald Peoples Jones. Then you're getting all the way down to to Ross and Samuel, who may become interesting, but they are a long distance away from where we made those two selections. So I think there's what I would like to see here is, is some uh, some wide receivers that we wouldn't want to draft get get picked over the next uh, you know, twenty picks or so. Yeah, now that we're basically set at receiver, you're hoping to get those receiver picks coming off and. Colin, we didn't necessarily set out with only one path in mind. You always want to be flexible for what your draft gives you, but I think that this one has been the perfect example of how 2023 sets up. We have all of those running backs and wide receivers early. We added a couple more here in the double-digit rounds with Rashad Penny, Rasheed Rice, and Marvin Mims, and now you look at the guys who are targets for us, and they're almost exclusively quarterbacks and tight ends now you had mentioned the zero rb guy so if we had taken an elite qb an elite tight end early then you have those running back names that you can fill in here so i like that part of it one of the things that does happen in ffpc main event and you want to be aware of is that it looks like that zero rb group is deep and that you can just kind of calmly work your way through it but that sort of around 11 to round 13 range they're going to more or less all go. And so, yeah, I mean, it can be a deep range, but again, you only have one pick in each round. So you want to make sure that the pick that you use and, and how you're attacking those zero RB names that is very intentional. You don't overstate for yourself how much RB depth you're going to be able to build. But when we think through here and some of the potential values that we might get, Jerry Goff at the 13, 14 turn is compelling because of who we have as the receiver to start but also i think very compelling when we try and figure out like how are we going to win week one and so to have sam laporta there to have jerry goff there to have rasheed rice there to have players where if they hit we can play them and if they don't we can bench them that's that little bit of extra flexibility that you definitely want to emphasize in these drafts over this next week i think because goff plays in that first game and once we're into this price range of QB anyway, then you're sort of thinking, well, instead of pushing that, maybe I'll go ahead and, and make sure I take him there so that we have that optionality for that week one start dynamic. But you think about the QBs that are there. I mean, Dak Prescott still sticking on the board yeah, right incredible. now. Then later you have Gino, you have Russell Wilson. I mean, Wilson probably a little bit less of a target than some of these other guys, but Kenny Pickett has been fantastic in training camp and in the preseason we mentioned kyler murray on the previous show as being a potential tournament winner then you have sam howell you have desmond ritter it's going to be hard to get locked out of qb and you can take some options there then you look at the tight end and hunter henry does go somewhat early in this one but i think that that makes sense he's been a kind of an odd guy for me in that 
the RV Triflex startup that Bjorn and I are doing, I mean, he lasted basically to the end. I mean, Hunter Henry is a big name who had a bad season last year, but now profiles as a guy who could score a lot of points in this revamped New England Patriots offense. So I think I that's a smart pick, a, even if you have to reach for him a little bit. We did a BBM draft, Sean, I don't know, maybe like, I don't know, two, three months ago, and we were talking about the options, and it was Gasecki came up, and I said about like quite a bit Hunter Henry, and at that point, he was going undrafted. The, uh, the drumbeat has been more than I could ever have imagined for uh, Henry coming up here. Well, I mean, he should definitely never have been going undrafted in the first place. If anything, he's still a little bit too cheap. So that we lose an option there who sometimes comes back through. He was picked at the 1204. His ADP is the 1412. Again, just over the last 24 hours, which is quite a few drafts. But so that part is interesting. As we're looking at it here, column tight end is still the position where if we end up having some real regrets with this team, it might be there. We lose Henry, but we still have Trey McBride, a guy that I think is just mispriced. And oh, anytime yes. that you have somebody you think is clearly mispriced, number one, you want to get a lot. But number two, you want to remember that, I mean, there's a decent chance you're wrong <laughs> if you have that kind of evaluation that's so far off from the community. So you don't want to gamble your entire season on Trey McBride hitting. That wouldn't make sense. We also have Michael Mayer who's available late. I mean, there are going to be some picks that we can put in. Again, if you're kind of thinking like these two rookie tight ends are going to fix the problem, that might be an overly optimistic, you know, rose colored glasses type of view. And yet when you have some of those guys as late options, I think you can push it a little bit as we have done. Another name here that is still available column and it does kind of jump out to me as somebody we might consider even where we are at the running back position. If Kendra gets back to us, yep. I don't know about you, but he looks pretty incredible in uh, preseason week two. Yeah, we have as well. Sean mentioned how you know the zero RB guys can, can disappear pretty quickly and um, over the that spell since oh he does he does go there Sean over the last spell since we took Mims Spears went in the next pick then it was Musgrave Henry Zay Jones Elijah Mitchell Adam Thielen but Algier goes then Dak Prescott then Rashawn Johnson then Tyler Boyd Aconco Sean went uh, quite a bit after ADP in this draft which was was interesting usually the 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 tenth round goes in the the last pick of the the twelfth round here in this particular draft Jake Ferguson's after going but after that Mingo Zamir White, Kendry Miller, who Sean mentioned. So we are seeing some of those guys get hit. And I'm always interested, Sean, in who's drafting against us with your rankings and, and things like that. But I know Jamal Williams isn't high in your rankings, but we get a Johnson, Miller, Brees Hall running back crew here in the, the third spot. We'll see who gets back, who lasts back. But I feel like the tight ends and the, the quarterback will be an option here. You, you mentioned off I, I i think it's worth the the play here at this particular point if it gets back so he's usually in that 14th round is right at adp if he would last back here it would make all the sense in the world i think to to take him there's a chance that somebody does make the the leap and grab him but everyone between us now and our pick has at least one quarterback one of those guys having having two qbs but we'll see what happens stranger things could play out but usually you know, if this was a baseball draft, you'd be thinking somebody's just going to try and snipe you to ruin your, your stacks. But we have Laporta, we have St. Brown, so it kind of will, will fit in here um, with what we're doing. So let's see how it plays out. Josh, Justin Tucker, sorry, first kicker off the board in the mid-13th. Obviously, the best kicker in the NFL. Makes sense that he's the first one off the board. So we'll see some of those kind of plays come into effect here. But we have seen Sean quarterback and tight end be a little bit interest in this we've seen a lot of falling quarterbacks in this draft and we've seen tight end get i, I mentioned a conquo going that little bit later but most of the guys have been been pulled up quite a bit so the other player that may be in the mix but i think we're pretty set at, at the wide receiver position unless we get completely overpassed with our options here but um rondell moore goes in this kind of a, a zone other quarterbacks that haven't gone you know kurt cousins hasn't gone off the board yet uh, Geno smith Aaron Rodgers. Lots, lots of quarterback options and and kind of you don't get the elite options but i feel once you go past those elite guys this is the tier that you want to be operating in and it may be a case we take off here and we still like you you played about with earlier with uh 
Kyler Murray, for example, but there is a lot of other options to get that second option, Desmond Ritter, often going undrafted in this format. So lots, lots of potential options. Mostert goes off the board along with Damian Harris. So now, Sean, we are three. Oh, that went quick. <laughs> the San Francisco defense and Jerome Ford went off the board in rapid session. So we're set up here, Sean. Jared Goff, I think, is the, the clear first pick here for us. And then we can discuss that second option. But with what we've built so far, I think I'm probably leaning into the, the tight end crew. So you're thinking tight end, and I, I definitely and, and I'm also I'm willing I'm that. willing to push tight end. Um but I'm also thinking there's select ones like there's probably four tight ends that maybe probably max four tight ends that we really want to get on this roster. Kirk Cousins goes off the board. Yeah, the issue as we move forward is that I mean you're probably gonna reach at some point. And so who are you the, well, least the other the other players lose? in the mix if we pass on the the tight end position for me would be probably by by op- options would be hubbard and then more have you so that? well we have jsn and again i don't put a huge amount of emphasis on this in redraft but i mean gino is a full round below adp and we could apply some of what we discussed in the last show which again you you resisted and so i I don't i don't want to push it if you're not comfortable with it but this idea of getting quite a few of these quarterbacks and seeing how the early season progresses i I, it's tricky because you 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 kind of think well i mean gino played well last year he's got the three stars he's around below adp i don't know that there is like any significant difference between him and Sam Howell, Desmond yeah. Ritter, Brock Purdy. And that would be that would be my the only reason I would go against it is if we have Goff now who we have selected, we have the option to pick up those guys later on. Okay, so you want to lock Mayer in so we don't get stuck at tight end. Uh, well, if you want to go Mayer, I would have pro- and McBride's a reach here. I would probably want for him over Mayer. Do you want to go with Hubbard? Have you strong lean for? I, I think we could get that fifth running back. It would make sense to the cupboard here. Um, <laughs> Sean takes <laughs> Michael. <Mayer. laughs> what happened, Sean? Tell me what happened. What happened was that we did run down to the end of time. I didn't have enough time to explain my full thought process on this, which is that Hunter Henry went early, which took one of those guys out. I think the only two remaining draftable tight ends are Michael Mayer and Trey McBride, both of whom are just very risky in their own rights. And so if we think those are the only two guys and we need three because we're taking a ton of risk, then we probably need to lock that position in and let running back fall. It's one of the things that we can do when we took the three running backs early. So between the different positional elements And then what we're looking at for ADP here and how many guys are going to be left at the different picks. Now, Hubbard is the only remaining running back that we have currently in the queue, but players who might do something similar, Ty Chandler, you know, maybe a Deuce Vaughn, Kyron Williams has generated a lot of buzz. It was cool because the first edition of the zero RB list came out on wednesday and then and it featured sean tucker as number 15 and the very next day he's splitting reps with the first team with rashad white that part was pretty cool i think that those guys not that they're going to be chuba or that it's the exact same play but i think it's similar enough that if we miss chuba we're still okay if we missed mayor we were going to be in deep trouble yeah, that, if, now that you've talked through that is is very fair. So I will I'll give you a pass on that one, Sean. I'll give you a pass. Uh, <laughs> but we get uh, we get Mayer and to go with Laporta. And I said there was four names. Sean has corrected me. There was there's basically three names. McBride, just for people who are are listening and wondering where he may go, it's going to be interesting. Like we take we take Mayer there, Sean, at the fourteen oh one. He he is usually a 16th round pick and, and Trey McBride is usually a, a 19th round pick so to talk through that we have kind of set in our mind that those last 
probably three rounds, maybe four rounds are going to be a mixture of kicker defense and another quarterback. You know, we're looking into Sam Howell potentially. You know, Brock Purdy would be there. Kenny Pickett, who Sean mentioned, Kyler Murray is a, a 16th round pick. From a strategic point of view, what would we be thinking about in terms of like I think are you, are you thinking at the next turn we just we just go and get McBride if that's the only name we have left at that position and and it becomes a because this can get very flat very quick unless Hubbard makes it back to us Chandler did go and I don't expect Hubbard to make it back to us he's creeping towards the top of ADP here uh, Ron Elmore who we've talked about a few times and Hubbard are top, top three with the Philadelphia defense so unless we see kind of a, a defensive run here but Deuce Vaughn potentially makes it back to us in the next round as well and um, obviously you mentioned the drum beat down in, in Tampa there as well yeah so we can get some big fallers at these prices this range of the draft we can get some big reaches the 15 16 would be the turn that we would need to get McBride if we want to definitively say that he's going to be on that roster but we can also be a little bit gutsier and pass him through i thought there was a possibility that we might continue to see just some massive qb fallers it'll be interesting to track what happens here over the final seven six and a half rounds gino did go two picks after we selected aaron Rodgers goes in the middle of the 14th we're now getting some wide receiver names like van jefferson and Jaden reed who are coming off we do have two kickers who have come off. I think especially with the Bucker situation, that probably makes sense. We have the San Francisco defense. So managers will be addressing a wide range of objectives as we tick down to the end. Chuba at the 14-12. So he doesn't come back around. We do lose him. Colin, how comfortable are you with just having the four running backs considering the four guys that we have oh yeah very comfortable how comfortable are you with taking a bunch of quarterbacks now that we didn't start off with six running backs sean uh more open to the quarterback option okay okay uh we can make compromises what are you thinking when you say a, a bunch are you thinking three like we talked about or more than three <laughs> Sean, are things about to get wacky here? <laughs> Potentially more than three. But we'll have to see who's there. See who's there. I, I feel like, obviously, you can get overconfident in um, projecting these guys forward as to what could happen for the this season for these quarterbacks. But it feels like the quarterbacks that are going this late in the draft have a lot of upside with their profiles and i obviously you're kind of almost taking in some insurance on that position as well and something you did talk through on the friday episode and made a lot of sense that i wasn't thinking fully through before you mentioned it is the acquisition value of some of these guys so we see in this draft for example the drafter out of nine takes allen and two and two it was after his adp but that was two quarterbacks through 11 rounds we have um, another team who got a discount on Dak Prescott, but that was Lamar Jackson and Dak Prescott through 12 rounds. So we're seeing that. And then if it's a case that you really push it out and you, let's say Sam Howell would fit into that category, even a Desmond Ritter. Like if Desmond Ritter comes out in week one, and this may not happen, but you know, throws for three touchdowns, rushes for a touchdown, he's going to be somebody that people are probably looking to, to pick up on and add to that roster. And it mightn't even be week one, but you know, once we really start to get to the buys, having some of these guys who have, started to break out would provide you know a discount to what you're trying to do on the waiver wire with other positions so i'm guessing that's still your kind of thought process as to why we would take more than two because like it feels like in most redraft leagues you're going to be and obviously the stakes involved in this but most redraft leagues you're probably going to be like well i have one quarterback and i'm pretty happy that i'll you know use him for a, a portion of the season at least through the bye but then if you get into a situation where he, he gets injured or, or doesn't perform, you're obviously picking it a, a quarterback up off the waiver wire. But I don't think the competition for the waiver wire in most leagues are as, as stringent as it will be here in the, the main event with the tactics that would be employed. And then the other part is if you take two and then let's say one of them 
Buster gets injured. So you're kind of taking quarterback insurance with trying to get players that should have been drafted at that point in the eighth or ninth round of the draft. Yeah, I mean, anybody who blows up in weeks one or two at QB is going to get a big bid. And so you either have to let him go at that point or you have to bid over an opponent. And that torches so much of that free agent budget that you're going to need late in the season to make that big running back free agent acquisition. Even if you don't end up needing him yourself, you're going to want to block the other two or three teams that are competing for the title with you. And I really want to build this team to win the entire tournament, not just have the upside to win this league. I think that Sam Howell has massive upside. I think Desmond Ritter has massive upside. I think Kenny Pickett has very serious upside. I think Brock Purdy has crazy weapons. But I'm not foolish enough to think that I can pick the guy who's going to definitely do it this year. Why would you not stash those guys when they're virtually free? The names who have gone in this round, <laughs> like the last six picks are Michael Gallup, Isaiah Hodgins, Michael Wilson, Darius Slayton, Hayden Hurst, and Deuce Vaughn. And when we get to you're passing the, up on that kind of player. <laughs> this is the this is I mean, the fifteenth round. When we get into if you think about the you know the the eighteenth round here, it's gonna it gets pretty ugly from this point forward. So there isn't many guys we're targeting. We're one pick away, Sean. We're hoping that we get a bypass here and we we get our guy Trey McBride, who is well away by ADP terms um, on the roster here. It is the Dallas defense that goes. I, I think for me, McBride is the. The force pickup. It is interesting that Rondell Moore continues to to fall down here. But are you good with getting that? The, the, because there's really nobody else we wanted at the tight end position at this point. Yeah, I think that we should go with Trey McBride. And then, kind of, my question for you with all of those QBs being available, where where are you feeling the most upside is if we start to stash some QBs at this point? I think it's probably Kyler Murray and Sam Howell. Obviously, you're missing a portion of the season with Murray, and I still have some concerns that they're not going to go all in uh, to try and win games this season with some of the moves they've made already. I don't know if we should just take Howell and and see who comes back to us because I have a feeling that you know between Pickett, Purdy, and Murray, somebody gets back. And so. Have you a preference? Well, Pickett has looked awfully good, and he is the most expensive of the three or four. I mean, Kyler Murray is the most expensive. The other thing here is that if you want to give you know any little edge to the QB with one of our receivers, we have Brandon Ayuk. And so I think that, I mean, for me, I still think Howell is the guy with the most upside. He's probably a little bit more likely to come back than some of the other names. Um, who would you regret missing out on the most out of these guys? Eight seconds left to go. Make the pick, Colin. I mean, this is this is the OT. Yes. <laughs> Had to be, Sean. Had to be. How do you feel about that? Is that is that a pick you would have made if I didn't kind of try and guilt you into making it? Silence. We'll say no, because I do think that he was going to come back. I would have taken him at the next turn. I think that there is a little potential for regret if we don't get Purdy or Pickett coming back. And yet, I mean, Colin, we're not going to talk about Sam Howell all season long and then have him look good in the preseason, which again comes with these huge caveats of, <laughs> you know, it's against backups and defenses that are not running their real stuff i mean you should look good i mean jordan love has looked good do we feel like jordan love is locked in or that kenny pickett is locked in because they look good in the preseason i mean you should look good but it's better than looking bad i mean we're going to talk about him from january to august 25th and then pass him in the main event i mean you got to go with your guys in the main event well, that's the one thing I was going to say is uh, we do talk about these drafts and we do say we draft the players we talk about, Sean. I think the listeners, like it, they may have thought at one point it was a bet, but uh, we're drafting Sam Howell uh, in all formats and, and we're very happy about it. So we'll see if it works out, but we are putting the money on the players that we, we have discussed. So it's not a case of we, we're going to back out and, and hide at the end of the day, but 
Rondell Moore goes Sean Otto pick at this point of the draft. A, a really strong discount on that pick. I, I feel Sean. Well, it's one reason it. to put your team just on auto pick late in the draft <laughs> and let it do its job for you. <laughs> one of the, the best auto pick selections you could probably get at this point, I think. Um, when we look, though, Sam Howell, I just feel the upside is, is so high. I also think that Purdy, with everything, if it all clicks in terms of he continues to do what he did last year but also we get a, a healthy Debo Brant Mayu takes a step forward again and then Kettle stays healthy I think he has a huge huge upside but I also feel like in a weird way I feel like I have more question marks about that because I think that they are going to be so good that they're going to you know beat teams up on both sides of the ball and win pretty comfortably whereas I still think Washington are going to have to really try and put up points to keep with teams um also like this isn't the exact reason as well but they're going to face off against the eagles twice this season which <laughs> if you want to beat the eagles you're going to put up points um and it also may play in nicely with the likes of cd lamb even though they're not going to be facing each other directly they're going to be facing them twice this season uh, and i think that division has the potential to be pretty high scoring so Purdy does go off the board. I, I don't think, Sean, it's something that I... We may regret it at the end of the season, but I don't think come the end of the draft it's going to be something that we, we will say that we regret passing. Pickett would be a nice one to come back, I think would be would be an interesting play. And with having Howell and Goff, it really opens the door for Kyler Murray, although you know, you're, you're not going to get him to start the season. But you're not looking to have him. He's just one of those players you're going to stash. Like Kyler Murray, if he's coming back in, in week six, week seven, he's going to be a, a very high acquisition cost. But I think you can, with the way this roster is constructed, would you have more confidence in, in being able to hold him through that zone? So, like, obviously, we could have injuries over the next two weeks to ETN, Williams, and, and Stevenson. But, you know, usually we would not have that kind of player on the roster. And then we're, we're trying to, you know, keep picking up potential running back starters for the roster but because this team should be pretty locked in at running back it's probably a little bit easier to to take that quarterback through the roster and i'm just going to ask you now is that part of your thinking when you were thinking about you know going a running back heavy draft and still taking three quarterbacks yeah i mean that kind of thought experiment that we ran through where you take six running backs to start then you take six wide receivers i think the receivers are there for it because one of the things that i'm looking at right now is that Rasheed Rice and Marvin Mims in rounds 11 and 12 I really like. Now, that may just be you know, too much enthusiasm for somebody who does like to draft rookies. But, I mean, those profiles at those prices, Rasheed Rice should be more expensive than Sky Moore was last season. And he's there because Sky Moore busted. And so, I mean, you take advantage of that. Marvin Mims, we absolutely love. We have four rookie wide receivers. And... There are going to be some listeners who <laughs> look at that and say, I mean, you've got a lot of risk there. Maybe your team is actually just on the Ross St. Brown, C.D. Lamb, and Brandon Ayuk. But one of the things with that is that if you had those three elite running backs, then you still have your early season covered just with those guys. So we can work through that element of it. I do think that if you get that balanced production early in the draft because it's just so important this year and you get such i don't say great values but we talked about this necessity of handling both running back and wide receiver this year because you always have to handle wide receiver and then running back is giving you these crazy prices the question then you have to answer is well how do i pass on all of those elite quarterbacks and still compete i think that this is the way to do it or it's at least one possible way to do it and it's humility based we talk about being humility based all the time so that part of it i really like as we come down here to these last couple of picks it'll be interesting we have two picks remaining that are not going to be kicker and defense and then we do have the kicker and defense as we look at that there are a couple of names that aren't qbs now i think we could go to four qbs here because taking two out of three of pickett murray and ritter appeals to me a whole lot because again we just don't know but the other two names that really jump out to me down the stretch here are Sean Tucker and Justin Ross. I think that maybe Mike Gesicki 
would also fit into that. It seems like the injury that kept him out for a while is maybe not going to be a huge deal. And I still have some optimism that he could be kind of a joker player in that offense, especially if Tyquan Thornton is not going to do anything. I mean, you're starting to talk about Juju Smith-Schuster and Devontae Parker as being the main targets in that offense. That would seem to leave a lot on the table for other people. I know that you weren't necessarily thinking of taking that many QBs anyway. When you look at Tucker, you look at Ross, contrast them with the quarterbacks who are left and we're trying to figure out how do we win a tournament what do you find most appealing as we head to the 17 18 turn i like tucker and ross uh <laughs> but i i don't think it's a case that i i think we make if, if they make it both to us i think we make a a call on that the part i was going to ask you about was do you see any value in taking the kicker of the defense before the 19th or 20th round that was my plan coming in i'm just wondering just from your perspective is there anyone that's standing out are you happy to wait that would be kind of my thought would be i'm happy to wait and then i do think that i'm open to the third quarterback and then one of those players if that became the the way we play it out well i really like evan mcpherson so if he had been there i would have made an argument for him he does go however and so with that potential play being off the table then I don't have a preference there. So pick it goes. We still have, it's interesting. Russell Wilson is still there. Nobody wants him. Nobody wants him. Uh, Feels like again, you know, it may be the end of Russell Wilson, but if you're looking in this portion of the draft in the late 17th round, well below his projected ADP for this format in the 15th round, it feels like there's still upside there. I'm not, advocate in the draft him but you know if we're talking about kyler who's been injured potentially bouncing back you know there's, there's still a chance here i think for for russell at this point of the draft desmond redder the reason i was asking sean about the kicker and defense part redder is likely to be available to us in the 20th round as a potential option that was the reason i was was thinking off that um one pick away The Tucker, oh, uh, Tucker went. Goes to the drafter yeah. who knows what he's doing. Yeah. Uh, that would have been a nice pick to finish out the, the running backs. He, uh, that's a disappointing one. First real disappointing one for me, I think, of the, the entire draft. I'm good here for you. Do you want to take a shot on Justin Ross? He's really the only... I know you mentioned Gasecki. I don't have a strong lean there. I think I, I, would, I would rather ross for the potential upside there what's your thoughts yeah so you you prefer i I would prefer ross over gasecki if we're looking at like a non-quarterback option okay we'll take justin ross there because again i mean there's this outside chance that he actually even blows up in week one in which case which is also thursday night football so colin what i'm looking at here is we could take tyler bass and have a kicker on an explosive offense who has a late buy and so you don't have to deal with that element as you go through and then we would be kind of looking at ritter in the 19th or we could go ahead and stash kyler murray here and be looking at the potential to again have a tournament winning kind of guy in the 18th round which direction are you leaning i'm not against the kicker option if you if, do you want to go that way i guess i'm willing i'm kind of willing to see what comes back to us at the quarterback position okay so we'll take bass and see how the rest of the league plays this and that, that again we did i mentioned numerous times in this draft the last two rounds but you know you're getting the buffalo bills kicker kicking in buffalo can be a challenge but you're also on an offense that should give them a, a lot of opportunities to to kick and the, the late bye week's a nice thing to not have to be overly concerned about um obviously sean made that pitch to draft the kicker i hadn't mentioned the kicker before that so that was a sean siegel pick <laughs> <laughs> i really do think we could get um i think we can get redder in the the last turn here and i think that's straight up 
would you rather take the chance on Ritter with the unknown? I know it's not unknown, but going into the second season where we haven't seen much, or Kyler Murray going into the season where we've seen the upside, we've seen the downside, and then he's coming back from an injury? Yeah, I mean, there's no question that Kyler Murray is one of those guys who gives you that elite upside. He's talked about trying to be ready for week one. That was never particularly realistic, and yet rumors of an Adrian Peterson-like recovery were out there. We got probably not great news yesterday with the trade for Joshua Dobbs. And one of the little nuggets that has also now been floating around with that is that the Cardinals may be telling people that Murray's chances to play this year are not great, which our great friend Ben Gretsch has been saying all along (laughs) is the way that he is kind of seeing this. And so that concern now makes it tough because again, you have to burn a very important roster spot where you go into week one, week two, every year is a little bit different. And last year wasn't perfect for this. But when we think about how you're going to spend your free agent budget, most of the time, the most effective ways to get your bang for the buck there and to turn those last two roster spots into guys who can make a difference as opposed to just names who are at the end of your bench is to spend meaningfully across those first couple of weeks. If you've got a guy who may never play for you and you're burning the roster spot, then that hurts you. And so those are the kind of competing elements there. Every day that it becomes less likely that Murray plays, and I guess I'm always skeptical kind of in both directions. I'm skeptical when people come out and say a certain player is going to be healthy, they're going to do it, they're going to beat expectations, they're going to be 100%. And I'm also skeptical when people say there's no chance that you know this guy is done for the year, that the team doesn't have incentive to play him, that they're not going to be competitive. I mean, this is professional sports. If we meet in the middle, then I think Murray is still interesting. And yet, because of that problematic element there, maybe we decide to go a different direction. There are guys we want to see in week one and two. We're not going to get that with Kyler Murray. And to stash him and then have a Sam Howell blow up, to have a Desmond Ritter blow up, that's going to be doubly impactful in terms of a, a gut punch that we had the option of avoiding. The, the other part with it then is like we see the teams with one quarterback so far. So we have the team in, in one, they have Herbert. We have the team in two, they have Mahomes. The team in three has Burrow. Um, the only one quarterback team that remains um, that you'll be saying should be taking at least a second one here would be Deshaun Watson. Um to the drafter out of the fifth slot so we have seen the team in one pass again on quarterback um they may just be built into the elite options that they have selected and say a herbert mahomes borrow we'll see if the two and three pass but sean if the two and three pass i don't know if there's gonna be a lot of other teams that are really considering going for that third option which again would open the doors of one of them getting back to us even Russell Wilson, should he make it back to the 1920 turn, becomes interesting as well because it gives you that couple of weeks to see if the Broncos are bouncing back with Sean Payton or if they are, if Wilson is, is done and dusted. So we'll see what happens. We we have a, a number of picks, obviously, to get back to us here at this particular point. We have eight picks to go. I'm, I'm pretty confident, Sean, one of these three guys get back in Wilson, Murray, or Ritter. As I say that, the Kansas City defense goes off the board with somebody who isn't in consideration. You mentioned Justin Ross as well, who could go off in week one. That is the Thursday night football game. So we have quite a bet involved in that, which means the options to potentially switch some of those guys in or out post Thursday night football. So that could be could be nice as well. It would also mean that he's somebody whose value, if, if that did happen, would increase quite a bit after week one. So playing it out here, moving along. We have to get a defense, obviously, Sean. So I, I, I don't want to, to go against your dream here. Do you want to get the third quarterback? Yes. Are, uh, is there is there another? We could take two defenses. <laughs> <laughs> the two defense play is probably less ideal. Right. Curtis Samuel is still there. Mike Gesicki is still there. 
those guys are names to think about if we lose the two quarterbacks that we are oh, and that was targeting. Something. Sorry, I, I mentioned Wilson. Uh, no interest there even at this point of the draft? Probably not very Four much. Four rounds the, after ADP. <laughs> yeah, I... I just want to make sure that you can get you know your third quarterback if we miss out on Kyler and Ritter. They want you to not get the third one. You have talked me around though, so it, it's uh, it's definitely a play. The seconds tick down to our selection, Sean. We have two picks to go. We're going to do them back to back here in the nineteenth and twentieth round. Since we talked, no quarterback has been drafted, so this round has worked out pretty well for us. We'll definitely have an option at one of them. There is concerns around Kyler and if he is going to be involved for the season. Does that there, you know, with it being a nineteenth round pick, still have you know, we can we can cut him if he's if he's not getting used, but how do you feel about that and potentially having to hold him for, for longer than you would want? Doesn't matter, Sean. We are on the clock and Desmond Ritter's available. <laughs> what do you think? Well, let's... I mean, we like Desmond Ritter better than Russell Wilson, right? I think that's fair to say. Okay. Who, though, who, again, who has the most upside? Say Jerry Judy's back. We get Sutton, we get the tight ends going, we get Javante going. What's Wilson's upside this year? Who can be a top 12, let's say, quarterback? Desmond Ritter. Okay. So, Colomar, other selection here needs to be a defense. We have the Bengals looking at Deshaun Watson and Cleveland in week one, and they have been a little bit, eh, some mixed reviews, we'll say, from their camp. The one that I'm looking at here, though, the Jacksonville Jaguars have anthony richardson in his debut that feels like a way to potentially put up a defensive touchdown get some sacks i like i like defenses on offenses you think are going to score a lot of points and both of these teams fit yeah which fits more for you since since he's interesting jacksonville is interesting as well so I'll, i'll let you split the difference but they both fit the bill for that yeah, I think that the huge difference there between the one. Anthony Richardson and yep. Deshaun Watson is the tiebreaker for me. I like having that extreme upside. Again, we want to get out there and win that week one game. Colin, we had one big disappointment, but when your disappointment comes in round 17, then you've had a good draft. We only took the four running backs total that was something that also did on the ship chasing draft the other night we have a build here with three tight ends all of them relatively late three qbs all of them early late we did miss out on drake london at the 511 but we're very happy with the options we had we missed out on marquise brown at the 711 but you know, probably in retrospect are actually happier about the guys that we do get. Recap the team for us and give me your thoughts. Yeah, so in terms of the the overall team, I'll go through it first in an order of draft pick, then we'll go through it in position, but it's Amon Ross St. Brown, C.D. Lamb, Ramondre Stevenson, Travis Etienne, and Javante Williams, Brant Nayuk, JSN, Zay Flowers, Sam Laporta, Rashad Penny, Rasheed Rice, Marvin Mims, Jared Goff, then we get Mayer, McBride, Sam Howell, Justin Ross, Tyler Bass, Desmond Ritter, Sean gets his third quarterback, and then we get the the Jags defense. So in terms of the quarterbacks, it's Goff, Howell, and Ritter. Kicker, obviously Tyler Bass, defense, Jacksonville. Tight end is Sam Laporta, Michael Mayer, and Trey McBride. So a lot of youth there, but a lot of upside as well. It'll be interesting to see how the tight ends kick off the season with, you know, with the youth built into them. Then at running back, Sean mentioned four options, Stevenson, ETN, Williams, and Penny. And then at wide receiver, it's St. Brown, Lamb, Ayuk, JSN, Zay Flowers, Rasheed Rice. We get Marvin Mims, and we get Justin Ross. Interesting, Sean. We didn't talk about this at the time. I don't know if it was coming into your decision if we had Tucker and Ross both on the board. We do have two of the, the KC wide receivers. So again, 
very much uh, invested in that Thursday night football, which gives us flexibility then with the starting lineup. So we have Mims and Ross, we have St. Brown, Laporta, and also Jared Goff. Yeah, I mean, I, I love having that. It's just such a, a free square, and you think about, well, where could those guys go if they blow up in week one? I mean, if Re- Rashi Rice has seven catches for... If either of those guys are after Kelsey, the next leading target, you know, getter from Mahomes in that opening game, let's say one of those guys gets seven or eight targets, automatically they're up into the seven, eight round range, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, I think if he goes seven for 80 and a touchdown, which is not impossible we, at all. We would be happy with that. I think we would be well, happy Well, he that. would go in our lineup, but also in those handful of drafts that happened between the Thursday night game and Sunday morning, yep. I mean, I think he could go in round five. Could go in round five. And so that part of it is a lot of fun. You could see a similar dynamic for Sam Laporta, who I think would have to go in between Dallas Goddard and Evan Ingram if he has a big game. Probably a lot less likely that Justin Ross has a big game, but you never know. And then Jerry Goff, if he has to play catch up with the Kansas City Chiefs and the Chiefs don't have Chris Jones, which the last time I checked in on that, it sounded like they very well might not. When you think about that game between Kansas City and Jerry Goff, I believe in the year that Patrick Mahomes took the NFL by storm and the Jerry Goff Rams blew up over there with Sean McVay. I believe that game had both teams in the 40s. If you get a game like that from Lions Chiefs, then Jerry Goff is going to go in. I mean, again, he's going to be up there with Trevor Lawrence. And so to be able to make those plays in this draft and to not have to reach for them, I think if you're factoring that in so heavily that you make a bunch of moves to where you're giving up ADP value, then you know, you look at over the, after the Thursday night game and you're like, well, now those guys are going to go a round or two lower and you've lost across the board. I guess if the Lions players in that game disappoint, it will be frustrating and it certainly won't help our team's outlook. But at the prices that we paid here, I would still be fine. But there is a lot of upside. Colin, what are you thinking about the rest of the players? I, I'm very, very pleased with how it's played out. I was just doing some calculation here in the background, Sean, in terms of the players for people listening and who may be interested in you know prepping for the draft with the adp with the rounds and with sean's rankings up on the site i kind of made a spreadsheet to split out the players who we may be interested in at, at their rounds at their adps and how that may play out so you have the entire draft but looking at you know taking out kicker and defense through the draft itself and we we look at potential options I have a total of 97 names, Sean, that would have covered 18 rounds that we would actually have been interested in drafting. And there's some of those players that would be borderline. And you mentioned you know, not uh, reaching on players. That was one of the concerns that we could potentially have had drafting from the 112, where I know we did talk about it at the time, but somebody like a, a Brian Robinson who would be going kind of you know 12 to 14 picks after our pick. The, the only real players that we started to make those moves and make those reaches on or when we got to Trey McBride, Sam Howell, because we really felt strongly that we wanted those guys on the roster. But outside of that, every other player was you know, pretty much in that range of pick. And uh, picking from the 12, it feels like sometimes you could just get nipped on every single one of the tiers as you go down through that. And we were getting a little bit of pressure from that 111 drafter where they did a really nice job in this draft. But I think in terms of the preparation and how i was thinking you know two hours ago as we kick off this draft you know drafting in the main event there's always a little bit more nerves and uh, nervous energy than there is drafting and you know let's say a bbm draft for example because the difference in cost is huge i'm i'm delighted with how this draft has, has turned out and i know people may listen and they may be thinking you mentioned the rookies maybe some players in there that people maybe are watching this on youtube and they are thinking you know sam howell what's going on there or trey mcbride or the rookie tight ends let us know your thoughts but they're all players that we are are really heavily targeting this year and in terms of getting those targets out of those names that i mentioned that that's pretty perfect Yeah, and the one area of the draft or the team where I think we could be a lot stronger would be tight end. 
it would have been great if Fryermuth had made it two more spots. Although, I mean, again, that, probably that, not going to make it past the drafter in the seven yeah. eleven. Once then you're, he's if gone, he did, if he did make it, you're you're probably passing there on Flowers. But you know, that would be the decision point then between him and Flowers. JSN obviously would have made it in. In terms of the, I think what you're going to say is when he's gone, we've pretty much got the. There, there's probably like five tight end targets we have after that point potentially. We've got three of them. So I think it's... Yeah, and I think that the other spot that you're looking at there is probably Dulcich yep. in the 10 one And we took Penny. I like that as a big upside play if you're going to... I mean, round 10 isn't exactly a stash, but I think that you can play that Eagles offense that way and see how things develop for a couple of weeks. I mean, your round 10 pick you need to eventually have a use for, but we know that his upside there is just so extreme. I think that you could pick Dulcich at that spot and feel pretty good about it, especially after the Judy injury. But again, if the Judy injury isn't that big of a deal, then you're kind of back to where you were before. I guess I'm not as concerned. I'm concerned about the fact that Dulcich might not run as many routes, might not be the star, might not have that big time breakout upside. But I think that he's going to do fine this season. Whereas, so many of the other tight ends, I think, are very much sort of hope and pray kinds of moves. And really, you're just hoping that they score some points for you sometimes. The guy who has demonstrated some upside in the past would be Higby there at the 10-11. I guess I wouldn't necessarily expect that to continue, but you can certainly understand why that selection would be made. Once those guys are gone, I mean, again, I do like... Well, we had, but that was part of our preparation too. Yeah. Was knowing that we basically had two choices. One was to select Mark Andrews at the one-two turn, and you could easily see a situation where we re- regret not doing that. The other one was that we were going to have to go with this Laporta, Mayer, McBride type of tight end room, and we were comfortable with that. We were prepared for that. We were going to try and create advantages off of that at the other positions. I think it's mission accomplished from that perspective. Yeah, and for people who did listen in to last Friday's show, we talked about the lit young kind of tight end options. We also talked about the lit quarterback options. People that listened to that show as this draft progressed, I'm sure they were saying that we've ticked off a lot of those objectives. Whether it works throughout the season, we'll wait and see. But that is kind of giving you that ups- upside. You mentioned, Sean, during the draft, you know, to have the wide receivers we start off with, with St. Brian Lamb, Ayuk, JSN, and then Zay Flowers, and then to also have the three running backs and Stevenson, Etienne, and um, Jamison Williams, or sorry, Javante. Wait, let me write a note there. One. And Javante Williams, you know, that is all part of you have to pass on Mark Andrews, who we mentioned. And we did talk about it in that preview show as well. Drafting at the back of the draft with ADP, it's very, very hard to get one of those tight ends unless Firemouth does come unless goddard comes to that pick we didn't really have realistic expectations of that so i think pre-draft preparation and the planning that went into it i think is has worked out here and i think we've completed those objectives as you have mentioned i think sean any final thoughts i think i think we have recapped the team some of the teams you know will not go through each team but i, I do notice the kyle pitts drafter hasn't taken a second tight end the only drafter that went with one tight end we do get a team with Mark Andrews, George Kettle on it, which will be interesting to see how that develops throughout the season. We get a Travis Kelsey, Evan Ingram, Tyler Higby team, and the rest of them are kind of uh, a mixture of, of combination of late round tight ends out to that. So it's obviously tight end premium. But I think overall, it's going to be fun to see this. And hopefully, as we track it throughout the season, we are up and running and we're into those playoffs and we're challenging for the, the big money here. Yeah, I, I love this squad. So doesn't mean it's going to win, but you want to be prepared to execute your draft plan. We did that. We like the guys. We hope everyone enjoyed listening. A lot of fun for us to do. Really pleased with how it came out. If you want to check out any of the other Rotoviz Overtime content, you can find it on YouTube, on the Rotoviz YouTube channel. We're aiming to get to 2,500 before week one of the NFL season. Need about 40, maybe 30 more, I think, to get to that landmark. So if you haven't subscribed already, Please do so. If you're watching over there, drop us a written and review. We'd re-
drop us a comment we really appreciate that hit the thumbs up button and if you're listening on the audio side obviously drop us a written and review we'd really appreciate that as well my name is colin kelly you can follow me on twitter at over to marlin my co-host is sean siegel check out all of sean's work at oneroadabiz.com including the zero rb list which is now available and until we are back have a good one <laughs>